TransLink is preparing to update its regional transportation strategy, known as Transport 2050, and that will help establish a framework for the future of transportation in the region over the next 30 years. You will have an opportunity to have your say on what the future of transportation should look like. The public engagement period for Transport 2050 begins on May 6th and lasts through September. I should also take a moment now to congratulate TransLink on once again beating their ridership numbers from the previous years and setting record high ridership numbers. Uh, TransLink saw ridership increase by 7.1%, I believe, last year over the year before. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I've heard that what that means is they had 435.9 million riders in 2018. Now today, however, we're not necessarily here to talk specifically about public transit, but rather to explore the future of shared micro-mobility. In short, micro-mobility refers to any small modes of transportation powered by humans or electricity, such as bikes, e-bikes, scooters, e-scooters, or any other small lightweight vehicle that is being shared among multiple users. The question is, how will Metro Vancouver adopt these technologies in a way that supports and improves our quality of life? And to help answer that question, we are joined by a panel of specialists in their respective fields who will share their opinions and expertise with all of us. And we also want to make sure that you have a chance to engage with our panelists and ask them your burning questions. So today we are going to be using Slido. So visit slido.com, spelled S-L-I-D-O dot com, and use the event code, hashtag micromobility, to submit your questions. I think it's up on the screen. Is it? There we go, it's up there. So you'll be able to access it from your phone. Following the panel discussion, you're welcome to join us for an electric scooter and e-bike demonstration outside in Robson Square Plaza. I'm told that there's no ice out there, it's just concrete, so it's much safer. I would also like to put a shout out for the amazing social media team at TransLink. They will be live streaming this on their Twitter feed, that's at TransLink. So if you are on Twitter, maybe help them out and give them a retweet tonight. So to get things started, we're going to be showing a video. And after that, we're going to be hearing from Andrew McCurran, Director of Strategic Planning and Policy for TransLink, who will provide further opening remarks. Um, and after Mr. Andrew McCurran, pardon me, my notes are a little bit, they're a little bit mixed up, but after Andrew McCurran speaks, we will be hearing from Adam Hislop. So that'll be our next two speakers. So let's go forward with the video. How do I get down? <laughs>
Well, there you go with that inspiring opening um, from Parliamentary Secretary Ma and our uh, communications and, and marketing team at TransLink who put that great video together with, the, with really the question, what's next? That's going to be the subject of our, uh, of our panel this evening. What's next in the world of, of micromobility? Um, you know, it's an exciting and, and dynamic time in transportation. I'm sure as, you know, all of you here packed into this room tonight, if you're, you're here for a, a, an engaging conversation on this topic, you're probably also transportation nerds uh, and excited by the, by the huge, you know, the accelerating pace of change uh, in the transportation realm. You know, there's, there's change and disruption. It's exciting. It's also happening really quickly. Uh, you know, things are happening. They're happening fast. And, and I think because of that, it's even more important for us to pause, come together, and talk about what our values are. You know, remember what we're actually working uh, to achieve here, a, a livable region, a just, equitable, sustainable region, uh, and, and put those values front and center and leverage the, the power of all of this change and disruption and, and make sure that we're using it to advance our, our regional goals. Uh, on the subject of micromobility, um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of folks in the room might remember some of the early uh, the the world 1970s Amsterdam shared bikes at UBC. Adam uh, was reminding me the yellow bikes, some of which are still yellow and purple, I guess, on campus. The first generation really low tech. Second generation, you know, Velove in Lyon, uh, mid 2000s, Velib in, in Paris, really pioneered uh, uh, dockless or dock uh, station based um, uh, smart card accessed uh, uh, bike. Sharing and now, really, in the last few years, we're we're in this third generation uh, of of dockless uh, bikes and scooters and, and micro mobility. Um, some industry watchers uh, I've read uh, feel that this has been the fastest technological adoption in history. It's you know just in the last couple of years, the pace of of change of uh, of uptake of some of these services in cities around the world uh, has been has been breathtaking. Um, I think uh, investors agree with that assessment. According to McKinsey, venture capital, ride-hailing companies, and uh, traditional auto manufacturers have been pouring more than uh, almost six billion dollars globally into micromobility startups in the last four years. Um, you know, and the, and the epicenter really has been in China. In 2015, we saw this this third generation really explode um, with dozens of startups. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar as well with those. Quite shocking photos of mountains of, of bicycles piled up in parks or in or in dumps or being cleared out of public right of ways. A lot of those companies, those initial companies, uh, have since gone bankrupt. But I think what what they've shown is that there's a model there, you know. And and it's we're still we, we need to figure out I think what the sort of stable uh, future state looks like. Um, but clearly there's something for us to to experiment with, um, you know. And I think the the potential that they've shown uh, to really dramatically scale uh, shared active mobility in cities is, is something that we can, we can really all learn from. So the key thing, I think, though, is, is for us to leverage this exciting new technology in, in ways that advance our goals. So we need to manage it well. You know, we, we need to resolve some of those key issues that we've seen in other cities. It's, it's actually really helpful, I think, for us in this region. We often aren't the first movers, um, you know, ride hailing and dockless micromobility. We're, we're taking our time to get it right. And, and that's a good thing. Let other cities kind of figure out uh, some of the problems and challenges. We can learn from them and, and make sure that we manage things well. Um, in particular, in, in, in dockless micromobility, I think some of the key issues are around rider safety, uh, pedestrian pedestrian safety, uh, universal accessibility, making sure that we avoid piles of bikes and scooters blocking, uh, blocking the public right-of-way, uh, ensuring that new mobility services are accessible to people of all incomes and abilities, um, and ensuring, ensuring that cities have access to all of that good um, transportation data to make sure that we can continue to plan our cities effectively. So it, I'm very interested to hear sort of what some of the panelists have to say about some of those, those uh, key issues, I think, today. Um, in the region here, it might seem at a macro level that there's not necessarily a lot happening in this space, um, but uh, some of you might be aware uh, at UBC was the first to, to launch a dockless uh, bike share pilot uh, earlier in September. A number of other cities, uh, Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam, Port Moody, Richmond, UBC uh, as well looking at expanding uh, some dockless models. The North Shore is working on uh, all three North Shore municipalities working together on an, on an e-assist dockless bike share uh, program. So there's a number of things happening in the region. 
from TransLink's perspective, you know, we're very interested to, to help nurture this active, shared micromobility revolution. Um, and the, the region has a target to, to have 50% of all trips by walking, cycling, and transit by 2040. Uh, and, and so in the micromobility micro space, uh, we've been helping to, to convene a conversation um, with all the, the municipalities and develop a, a shared framework or some guidelines that really uh, provide some good common practices for um, planning and management of, of these sorts of services, focusing on things like data sharing, uh, payments, making sure that some of these services ultimately we want them to be seamlessly integrated across the region so we don't end up with boundary uh, effects, um, figuring out right-of-way management, operations, permitting. Uh, so if you're interested in, in seeing those guidelines, they'll be out in the next few months. And I think if you signed up, um, when you signed up for this event, if you, if you click the box, yeah, please send me updates, then we'll, uh, we'll email you a, a copy of those. So just a, a few final uh, thoughts. I think the other key thing, um, as uh, Parliamentary Secretary Ma mentioned, we're launching Transport 2050 on May 3rd. That's, that's next week. Uh, it's going to be a really quite big, hopefully robust conversation. We're, we're keen for all of you to participate actively in that um, about the future, about change, about what we want our region and our transportation system to look like in, in 30 years. Um, I personally think that the dockless you know, micromobility and, and this active shared modes, um, it's a really good opportunity for us to figure out a common framework in the region for um, working together, making sure that these things provide a great seamless customer experience, they advance our regional goals, so that we're ready when you know, ride hailing comes later this year, uh, when automated vehicles, uh, you know, robo-taxis become a, a more dominant mode of, of transportation uh, in the not so distant future. We really need to make sure that we've got our act together um, and that we can deliver those things effectively. So my, my sort of takeaway ask for all of you in the room is um, visit the, the Transport 2050 uh, website when that's, when that's launched starting next Friday. Um, start conversations with your networks. Uh, get out there, be active on social media. Um, really, this is our chance to think big as a region. Um, we're, we're keen for you to be bold. Give us your big ideas. Uh, tell us what you're passionate about. Is it about you know, electrifying the, the transportation system, new rail rapid transit connections, or micromobility everywhere across the region? Um, we we want to hear those ideas. We'd like those conversations uh, to happen across the region, uh, and we're looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. So with that, I'll turn it over to Adam Hislop for a few, uh, a few words. Um, he, uh, I think, has some great on-the-ground experience being uh, the first jurisdiction in, in Metro Vancouver to uh, have some operational experience with uh, Dockless Picture. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'd like to just very quickly echo Andrew's thanks to, to all of you for participating in this event and for uh, and welcome you on behalf of the university to uh, UBC Robson Square on these uh, unceded traditional lands of the Coast Salish people. Um, UBC is very excited about the future of transportation in this region and uh, happy to be convening this event with TransLink as part of what we hope will be an ongoing uh, dialogue to share ideas and collectively explore what opportunities and challenges uh, face us in the transportation landscape over the coming decades. Um, whether it be bold investments in an expanded rapid transit network, uh, rethinking the way we allocate and value our limited road space, or leveraging emerging technologies uh, to enable a broader range of transportation choices, UBC is keen to support regional conversations around these complex issues, drawing on the expertise and, expertise and intellectual wealth of our faculty and students in particular. Um, last year, the university updated its strategic plan shaping UBC's next century, which articulates our vision to inspire people, ideas, and actions for a better world. Central to achieving this vision is to not only lead by example as a model public institution, but to foster the kind of robust uh, discourse, knowledge exchange, and engagement necessary to build the capacity of our region uh, and the province to be global leaders in creating sustainable, livable, and, community and uh, healthy communities. As an academic institution and global center for research and innovation, we, of course, are keen to contribute to the public dialogue around these topics. Uh, but we're also fortunate enough to have at our Vancouver campus uh, a thousand acre living laboratory in the form of an urban mixed use community um, where around 80,000 people gather every day and where we can test out uh, some of these new ideas and, and trial emerging, emerging technologies in the real world and on the ground. Um, as owner operators of uh, 
substantial assets and uh, local regulators over uh, those lands uh, were able to be early innovators, seeing uh, what others might consider a risk as a research challenge. Um, we have the discretion to try new things, and as a community of researchers and innovators, uh, we have an incentive to try new things first. Um, and in the shared micromobility, micromobility space, we've been walking this talk in recent years by, uh, in a couple of ways, uh, partnering with Velo Metro to test out their VMO uh, enclosed electric three-wheeled bike share model uh, back in uh, 2017, 2018. Uh, we also, as Andrew mentioned, launched the region's first entirely dockless uh, free-floating bike share system with Drop Bike in uh, August of last year, uh, which is on the ground today still, uh, about 250 bikes, uh, and we've seen over 25,000 trips on our campus in that time. Um, and we're going to be transitioning this pilot into an ongoing program uh, starting this summer uh, that will dovetail with the regional uh, uh, guidelines that Andrew mentioned. Um, under our new strategic plan, UBC is uh, more committed than ever to really expanding its presence in the region and, and working with our partners to uh, address the challenges and opportunities facing the communities we call home. Uh, including enabling better transit and transportation options across Metro Vancouver and to UBC. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the panel discussion today uh, and the conversations that will follow, uh, as Andrew mentioned, in the, the Transportation 2040 uh, discussions in the uh, months to come. So with that, I'll hand it back over, I think, to Parliamentary Secretary Ma. Thank you so much, Adam and Andrew. I should also note uh, that earlier I said that the public engagement on Transport 2050 began on May 6th. Andrew then said that it was on May 3rd. I'm going to take a wild stab at it and suggest that given that Andrew McCurran is the Director of Strategic Planning and Policy for TransLink, he's probably got the date right and my notes are old, so it's May 3rd. Excellent. So we're next going to be hearing from four speakers with different perspectives on micro-mobility. I'm going to name those speakers first, and they're going to come up each one by one. The first speaker is Mr. Chris Schaefer from Lime. Second speaker is Mr. Michael Van Hemmen from Jump. Third speaker is Mia Kohot from Moby. And the fourth speaker is Dr. Alex Bigazi from UBC, who will be presenting on his research proposal, Human Electric Hybrid Vehicles. Uh, this is the title, Human Electric Hybrid Vehicles, Implications of New non New Non-Auto Mobility no, non-auto mobility options for street design and policy in the Vancouver region. And I have to say, as a Star Trek fan, when I first read this, human electric hybrids, I immediately thought, this is how the Borg start. <laughs> and then I thought, for those Battlestar Galactica fans out there, I said, no, 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 actually, this is how Cylons start. Um, and then finally, before I got here, I said, Bowen, you're crazy. He's just talking about Transformers. So um, let's begin here with Chris. <laughs> Thank you, uh, TransLink and, and UBC and Parliamentary Secretary, of course, for having me here today. My name is Chris, and I'm here on uh, behalf of Lime. And for folks that may not know uh, about Lime, I've got five minutes in my presentation today, so I'll, I'll make my remarks uh, rather brief. But Lime is a two-year-old uh, San Francisco headquartered tech company. Uh, we have operations globally on uh, five continents in 100 plus cities, uh, I think about 28 countries, uh, if I'm, uh, memory serves me right. Uh, and uh, in Canada, with operations currently, our pedal assist e-bike share operations in Calgary and our electric scooter share uh, operation in Waterloo, Ontario. Let's see if I can get this right. I work for a tech company. <laughs> nope. <laughs> There we go. Um, so uh, this uh, will be uh, not familiar for folks in the room, unfortunately. We've got uh, challenges with traffic congestion due to automobiles uh, that year over year, decade over decade, uh, we're seeing growths uh, in congestion. It's leading to challenges, of course, and we've seen City Hall in Vancouver here uh, this week debate a motion about uh, climate change emergency, and that stems, of course, from what automobiles will produce, which is uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and uh, with more automobiles on the road today, uh, with more traffic, it's leading to challenges around carbon uh, and environmental greenhouse gas emissions. 
Nope. It's rather sensitive, this device. Uh, nope. Well, we're going we're gonna to go there. Um, just warning to the next speakers, this one's a sensitive one. Um, so this is where Lime comes into the picture. Uh, if you take a look at the challenges with congestion, most car trips, and at least the data you see around the world, is 60% you know, of car trips are uh, within a couple of miles. Uh, majority of them are very short trips. And if you think about an electric scooter, for example, it's really designed for those trips that are just a little bit too far uh, to walk that you consider taking your own personal car, uh, maybe a taxi, maybe a ride share, a car share. That's what it's really designed for. And then if you think about the Pedal Assist e-bike, another Lime offering, it's just uh, designed to be, you're not going to ride a scooter that far, but you're going to take a electric bike even further, uh, and particularly in geography of hillier terrain, uh, an e uh, an e-bike particularly serves that use case very well. And if you think about the pollution that's produced by automobiles, uh, the beauty of products in micromobility space, particularly line products, are that they're rechargeable lithium batteries that power the e-scooter and the e-bike. Uh, and of course, the motor uh, themselves uh, do not produce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the, uh, the real beauty in the, in the product. That's a picture of an electric scooter, a stand-up scooter for folks that may not have seen one. Uh, and I encourage you to take a, an opportunity at the end to demo one outside. Uh, that's the e-bike. Again, you can demo one outside as well. Um, so so why, does, why does all of this matter? A couple of things. Micromobility brings new communities to two-wheeled transportation. Um, our data suggests about 27% of people just haven't ridden a bike in a very recent while. These are folks that, for whatever reason, aren't getting on bikes, but when given the opportunity to get on a scooter, uh, we're seeing dramatic increases in micromobility usage. And uh, this, of course, feeds well into city planning and transportation planning that's already underway for more active forms of environmentally sustainable ways of getting in and around your city. Micromobility reduces car use and uh, encourages car light lifestyles. We surveyed, this data is from a uh, 2018 global ridership a survey of our uh, rider base around the world, and about 30% of folks globally indicated to us that if it wasn't for the availability of a scooter, for example, in the city that they live in from Lyme, they would have taken a personal car, taxi, ride share, or other form of personal automobiles. So there's mode shift happening here, again, with cities uh, dealing with climate change, we think, again, micromobility and the benefits of it is it gets people out of cars into more active forms of transportation. The data is supporting this as well. And some of the pollution impact, I'll, I'll leave it up on the screen for a second. Uh, for sake of time, I won't uh, speak to it. But this is up until the end of 2018. We just announced today, actually, that we hit 50 million rides uh, globally. So. Um, the, the data from NACTO, too, was that uh, in about a year, uh, e-scooter trips have surpassed the bike share trips in North America. So this is, uh, particularly on the e-scooter side, uh, quite dramatic increases in, in micromobility usage. And lastly, um, we think micromobility advances equitable transportation. Uh, we've got here comparisons. You see increases in micromobility usage amongst people with uh, lesser economic means uh, of, of diversified populations, uh, and, and particularly amongst females as well. And we think that's, that's very good for that uh, equitable portion of the conversation. Oops, I'm into, I'm into jump. <laughs> So I'll leave it at that. I, I do look forward to conversing with you on the panel and, of course, outside with, with the demo. So, so thank you for your time. Thanks, Chris. I always appreciate when a, when a fellow uh, admirer of our scooters is able to, to get it up there. So, so yes, uh, my name is Michael Van Hemmen, and I work for Uber and, and Jump, as we'll go through the narrative of, of how we ended up up together, and, and we do scooters as well, but I'm going to spend most of my time uh, speaking about e-bikes today. So Uber's original transportation goal was to allow people to make more efficient use of their personal cars. However, as we delve deeper into the transportation system of cities, we began to realize that technology can actually play a bigger role in solving some of the problems that we have. 
So as we went from being a, a company that had black cars on demand to provide you with kind of a luxury ride, we, able, we began to, to start looking at the research and saying, like, hey, in New York City, 50% of the evening rush hour trips are actually faster by bike share, so unelectrified, just normal bike share, than by, than by taxi. So this got us thinking, so what if, what if we'd be able to expand Uber's vision, which had been everyone sharing a ride, to a world of a mix of shared modes, increasingly powered by zero emission electric propulsion as the easiest way to get around cities through transit, e-scooters, e-bikes, and yes, ride sharing as well. And that's what we're embarking on. So in partnership with trans, there we go. So in partnership with transit authorities and data providers, we are integrating transit trip planning and eventually transit ticketing into the Uber app, first in, in Denver in the United States. The second is by integrating a company called Jump into the Uber app, first through partnering and then, and then eventually through acquiring them. So Jump, uh, formerly known as, as Social Bicycles, was founded in 2010 as one of the initial um, proponents who bid on uh, New York City's bike share system, ended up not winning that one, but uh, getting Hamilton and Ontario's as one of their first big ones and spread to more than 40 bike share systems. And then as Social, bi so social Bikes, or SOBI, as it was known in, in short form, was looking at what's happening in China with all of these uh, new smartphone-enabled bike sharing systems, it found that, hey, we need to differentiate ourselves. How can we do that? And they decided to do it through e-bikes. So j they rebranded, Jump uh, came, came into being and became the first e-bike sharing system uh, in North America. That allowed uh, Sobe to use their design and be a technology-first company in order to solving these types of challenges. And so this has led to uh, some really interesting results. Chris touched on some of them. I'll, I'll give some from our perspective as, as well. So first would be that Jump Actually or e-bikes can complement docked bike systems. So in San Francisco, our first uh, system that we, that we operated, uh, we were able to do up to 10 trips per bike per day in a constricted ge geofence um, with a limited fleet size. But you saw that over the same time, the dock system performed as per normal. But the electric bike system, the dockless electric bike system, was doing two to three times the usage. The second thing, and Chris highlighted this as well, is that we've seen e-bikes actually take mode share from, from ride sharing. And you know, this is, if you're looking at like, well, why would Uber do this? Uber's a, Uber's a business. Obviously, uh, it eventually wants to be ma making money and, and acquiring more users. This is, this is the business reason why is that going back to that New York study trip, that 50% of trips could be done more quickly by, uh, by, uh, by bike than by taxi. In San Francisco, we found that in the first few months, people who used both Jump and Uber, they had a 15% increase in their Uber app use, but a 10% decrease in the actual number of ride-sharing trips that they were taking. So we were seeing a mode shift between, between the two. In addition, as you'd expect, e-bikes allow you to go further than normal pedal bikes uh, or, or docks. And so this is just me uh, kind of nerding out with you now a little bit with my personal experience because I've had a bike here for a, about a year now and I'm a very fair weather cyclist. Um, but, you know, able to get from downtown to about City Hall in 12 minutes when during the rush hour commute it, it would be 10 to 24 according to Google. Getting to the other side of Boundary, I'm able to do that 8 kilometers in 25 minutes. Um, Again, Google Maps at 5.30, 16 to 40 minutes. To North Vancouver, 36 minutes. Google Maps, 45, up to 45 in traffic. And this is where I, where I live uh, in Port Moody. And doing, you know, this morning, I did, I did this same, same ride, 20, 22 kilometers in 52 minutes, which, you know, your, your average car typically taking between 50 and 70. I actually had someone uh, once walk out of a garage right near my office and said, I passed you on the Barnett, but then I made up the time passing all the, all the way down. So what this, what this really means, and Andrew alluded to this, is that e-mobility or micro-mobility powered through electric uh, propulsion with active transportation as a part of that are able to uh, replace a whole bunch of trips that mo for most people weren't possible. Maybe if you were a heavy-duty cyclist, you might think of, of riding from Port Moody to downtown uh, for work. I never would have considered that. 
right? I'm a very much fair weather cyclist, so it's able to provide that. In addition, um, Micromobility also provides data insights for cities. So there's now a whole host of new data because you're having vehicles that have uh, uh, SIM cards inside of them that allow transit planners and authorities to be able to have access to anonymized uh, data that protects user privacy, which is key, but at the same time provides them learnings on, on routes in order to make infrastructure investments mm -hmm. and so forth. And then in addition to that, that data allows you to make insights around things like equity. And so we recently published a Medium post about our learnings in a couple of cities. And so, for example, in Washington, D.C., we found one-third of jump trips were occurring in areas of the city with low transit rider frequency. And so you can go online uh, to jump and on our Medium uh, blog to, to read more about how that, how that came to be. And I'm done with my time. Thank you for listening. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mia Kohot and I am the general manager of Moby. Uh, I remember maybe felt like yesterday when the whole topic of bike share was this brand new concept for Vancouver, but now all of a sudden we feel like the old people in the room because uh, our system's been around for three, year, three years, uh, since 2016. So um, I've been asked to kind of talk a little bit about the history of bike sharing in Vancouver and the Mobi system for those that uh, don't know how this all came to be and where we are now. Uh, so, uh, Moby by Chicago is operated by Vancouver Bike Share, and we're a subsidiary company of Cycle Hop, which is also doing business now as Hopper. Um, our bikes are supplied by Smooth, uh, an operator out of France, and they actually uh, run one of the largest e-bike sharing station-based uh, systems in the world in Paris. Uh, we have a, a partnership with the city of Vancouver, uh, and we're contracted by the city of Vancouver to operate their public bike sharing system. And uh, we also have a major presenting partner, Shaw, uh, which is obviously how we got our name, Moby by Shaw Go. Clicker. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so this is just a, a, some faces to all the people who are out there servicing the bikes uh, that are on the streets for you right now. Um, we have a pretty big team here established here in Vancouver. And uh, when the clicker works, uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of our parent company, uh, Cycle Hop. Uh, we uh, have been operating bike share systems in the more traditional way since 2011, uh, but in uh, last year uh, we launched our own product and our own app, uh, Hopper. So we now also offer dockless-based uh, bike sharing, and we'll be offering e-bike sharing and scooter sharing uh, in Cycle Hop's future. Uh, so for us uh, at Vancouver uh, Bike Share and Moby, we really believe in seamless mobility. Uh, we want to make bike sharing easy, accessible, convenient, uh, fun, and part of the transportation system here in Vancouver and hopefully eventually in the region. A little bit of a history uh, lesson. So uh, February 2016 is when the RFP was awarded to Cycle Hop and Vancouver Bike Share. And four months later, uh, it was a very busy four months, uh, we launched uh, our system with 23 stations and 240 bikes. And we had already signed up 3,000 founding members to participate in the system, which just shows how hungry Vancouver was for having a public bike sharing system. Uh, in December 16, December 2016, we signed on our major presenting partner, Shaw. And uh, it was, bike share was just popular in Vancouver from pretty much day one. Uh, in July of 2017, we celebrated our one year anniversary with over 400,000 rides. And uh, um, we had some pretty exciting things happen last year. We expanded to East Vancouver. And uh, in June of last year, we launched our Van City Community Pass. Uh, this is an equity program, uh, cash, uh, 
cash based cap pass where um, if people have a red compass card or they qualify for the leisure access pass uh, they qualify for a $20 subsidized annual membership and what's been probably one of the highlights of my job so far is uh, hearing the stories of these people who have bikes riding bikes has really actually changed their lives and you look at the station use and we're, we're seeing the patterns of usage in East Vancouver and uh, we've also lowered our age limit to 12 um, so we've had kids riding to Britannia and Raycam and it just uh, it, it's really changing their life and it uh, definitely is one of the things that brings me the greatest joy about my job. Uh, just uh, quick, some quick stats on uh, where bike share is in Vancouver. Um, we've had over 100,000 users of our bikes. Uh, we've had uh, over a million trips so far uh, since July of 2016. And um, I think what's really interesting is the actual usage of bike share. Um, our average trip length is 18 minutes and 2.9 kilometers. So it's really, uh, really being used for those short one-way trips. And uh, uh, I thought this would be interesting, too, just to show uh, the difference of usage. Um, Monday to Friday, we absolutely see those peaks and valleys over commuter times, where on the weekend we see a different curve. And I'm, in the winter, 95% of our trips are by members and by locals. And even in the summer months, we still see sep over 70% of usage by, by locals. So this is really being used uh, by the community as a great way to get around. Uh, so what's next for us? Uh, well, we're currently working on a pretty exciting uh, partnership with uh, TransLink Evo and Moto Cooperative on a potential seamless mobility. Uh, uh, we were part of the open innovation call last year, one part of the winner, so we're pretty excited about that project that we're working on right now. Um, we're always uh, hopeful and thinking ahead towards how we'd love to expand our system throughout the region, uh, connecting to those tr major transit hubs. And uh, we're also very hopeful that we'll be able to launch e-bikes in Vancouver. And uh, in the demo track outside today, uh, we have Smoove, our supplier. Uh, we have one of their e-bikes from Paris here um, that you're more than willing, uh, welcome to try out. And I think that's it for me. Great. Thank you. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Thanks for sticking around, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to TransLink to talk a little bit about the research we've been doing related to micromobility. Uh, so my name is Alex Bacazzi. I'm assistant professor at UBC, uh, the other UBC that's, well, medium far away, not Okanagan far away, but uh, West, uh, West Point Gray far away. And I'm in transportation engineering and planning over there. And uh, so I'm going to talk about kind of but not as much on the sharing side, because I figured uh, the previous speakers would cover that really well, which, of course, they did. Um, so I'll we'll be talking a little bit more about the uh, electric assist side of uh, micromobility and what we see coming with that. Uh, first try. Okay. Uh, <laughs> showing off to the degree. Um, okay, so we... <laughs> <laughs> so our research group uh, up at UBC, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's a joint effort between engineering and planning, uh, and it's called the REACT Lab, uh, Research on Active Transportation, and kind of our, our niche focus is that we look at the interface between uh, active transportation physics and physiology and travel behavior. So um, we look at kind of uh, pulling in uh, information from sports science and, and from uh, kinesiology and merging that with kind of the more econometrics kind of uh, uh, behavioral modeling techniques that are traditionally used in engineering and planning. And we think that's important, on, and I'll give a little pitch why. Uh, so imagine, it's a little small, but imagine a trip from the Fairview Slopes uh, out to UBC. Anyone who's been out there knows that there's a fairly large hill you've got to get up, right? And so as you're heading out there, if, you're, if, you're, if you picture taking a bike trip, there's a lot of plausible routes you could take. And each of those routes has a different uh, mix of, of, of characteristics of exposure to traffic, of, of grades, of surface, uh, facility types, etc. And and so, so say I'm considering taking that trip. So my preferred route is going to depend on my preferences. You know whether I see it kind of as an exercise trip, um, how I value time, how comfortable I am in traffic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
But beyond those personal characteristics, the attitudes and preferences, which is traditionally what we look at uh, in, in transportation uh, engineering and planning, um, it's also important to the equipment that I have available to me. Now, nothing, nothing against Moby, but if I'm considering taking that trip with a Moby bike, the routes might look quite a bit different than if I'm considering taking that trip with a carbon fiber, really nice road bike, right? So the hills, a 2% grade looks quite different with a really heavy bike versus a really light bike. Then on the opposite side of the spectrum, if I'm considering taking that trip with an e-bike, of course, um, again, those distances and those hills are going to be different. And so that's going to influence how I view those routes and ultimately the route I'm going to select. And so looking down the line, as, as we try to model the transportation system and how for, new forms of personal mo mobility are going to change it, then we have to to think about how the availability, say the proliferation of e-bikes, might shift the cycling volumes that we see on different types of facilities, might change how attractive different types of facilities are. Maybe we'll see more people detouring to the water where you see lower traffic but a little bit longer trip, right? And then, of course, those route decisions scale up uh, into our mode choice decisions. So the routes that are available to me influence the likelihood that I'm going to cycle at all. And if I don't have an attractive enough route for cycling, I'm just going to take the bus, right? Um, so that's the broad perspective of the type of research we're doing. So moving a little bit more specifically to the micromobility question, uh, I'll, I'll take a step back and first just talk about active transportation. So traditionally when we talk about active transportation, we talk about walking and biking. Sometimes transit's included in there, uh, but we'll leave that aside for now and just talk about walking and cycling. And that's, and that's typically what uh, we talk about. And uh, walking and cycling have um, long been kind of grouped together as the active modes or the non-motorized modes. And, and that's happened in the planning and analysis phases, and it's often happened in um, infrastructure as well. And uh, wa walkers and cyclists have, have very different characteristics. And we found uh, through, through research that... Um, they can operate pretty safely in the same environment. We don't see a lot of collisions, reported collisions. We don't see a lot of injuries, but we do see a lot of discomfort. And pedestrians and cyclists tend to not feel comfortable around each other. They have safety uh, concerns. And there are actually a surprisingly large number of incidents with some level of contact that don't actually result in a hospitalization or anything, but it's a level of discomfort. And so um, that's been recognized for a while in kind of this, the, the state of practice now for high quality bike and pet infrastructure is essentially segregation. And, and we've seen that now uh, through the recent changes the city of Vancouver done on the, on the upgraded seawall. You get a really nice separated facility for bikes and peds. Everybody's happy. We see less conflicts. We see higher levels of comfort. We see higher levels of usage. No problem, right? It's, 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 it's a good transition to move uh, towards this separation. But it might not be a long-term solution. And one of the reasons is we expect to see a lot more walkers and cyclists, right? So um, our, our goals for the cities and our goals for the regions are increasing walking and cycling, right, for a number of reasons. Well, um, as we see uh, bigger and bigger volumes, then we're going to need to see more and more segregation. Um, on top of that, we have the issue that we're talking about today, which is an increasing diversity of personal mobility devices, in including these electric mobility devices. And so we have a lot of, of new things, new, diff new types of e-bikes, uh, monowheel vehicles, the electric scooters that we're all excited to see. Um, all these kind of now d don't fit neatly into that bike-ped dichotomy, right? So what are we going to do uh, with them? Uh, so there's a number of issues that uh, transportation engineers and planners have to deal with with these increasingly diverse uh, forms of personal mo mobility devices that are coming to the streets. Um, there's policy issues about vehicle classifications, what's the best way to classify them, and, and then what are the applicable rules in terms of licensing, in terms of registration. Uh, how do we design facilities? What are the uh, facility operating restrictions? Who's allowed to use the facilities? Speed limits? What are the design vehicles for engineers to, you know, what, what are the stopping distances, turning radii, all those details? detailed des, uh, d design variables that we need. Um, in terms of infrastructure planning, um, can we design a continuous network? Can people get from point A to point B um, throughout the city with a minimum uh, quality of service on all the links along the way, right? Um, and of course, the sharing systems that we've been talking about. So there's a lot of challenges that come along with that. And I'll point out just a couple things 
Um, first, this is from a recent study where we, we interviewed a, a range of stakeholders um, from um, cycling advocates, governments, retailers, manufacturers of e-bikes, and we looked at the different types of vehicles that are currently classified as e-bikes under the Motor Vehicle Act, and we found uh, a very wide discrepancy in how people saw these vehicles in terms of whether they should be regulated like bicycles and whether they should be allowed to operate uh, on, on shared paths with pedestrians, right? And so, um, a pedal assist e-bike, people are pretty comfortable with those, treating those roughly like uh, conventional bicycles. But when you get to things like the VMOs, which uh, Adam mentioned earlier, these enclosed recumbent electric bikes, the scooter style e-bikes, then um, these are going to have very different operating characteristics and, and we're less comfortable with sharing them. And so here's an example where policy is really lagging behind uh, innovations in the market. And that's just e-bikes, uh, which have been around for a lot longer than e-scooters and some of the e electric skateboards and, and the other features. Um, then moving on to street design, complete streets is a concept that's been around for a long time, which is just the idea that we should, when we design our streets, we should design them for all road users. And what that t typically, traditionally has meant is pedestrians and cyclists, private vehicles, transit, and uh, freight. Right, so those are the, the, kind of the five categories of road users that need to be included in complete streets. And, and here's an uh, example from uh, some NACTO guidance, which is a Sorry, reverting into slang, but some, some industry guidance about what a typical complete streets cross-section might look like. Well, once again, well, what about uh, new forms of uh, electric assist micro-mobility? Uh, well, well, there's kind of three main ways this can go. One is kind of the default action right now with things that aren't uh, approved under the Motor Vehicle Act. Uh, we could effectively ban their operation, uh, like electric skateboards. Um, but, you know, we might be missing out on some of the benefits uh, of those forms of micromobility. We could provide new lanes for each of these new types of vehicles, but of course there are constraints there in terms of resources, in terms of, of, of street widths and things like that. Uh, or what might be the most attractive option is that we have groups of, the, uh, of road users share space. So we might have pedestrians sharing space with some uh, forms of micromobility, pedal cycles sharing space with other forms of micromobility, and then some might need to go uh, into the um, motor vehicle, private motor vehicle traffic lane. And essentially what's the best way to share space is uh, the kind of key motivation for the recently funded TransLink project. And I won't, I won't burden you with the title again, although uh, I like what you did with it. I like it too. It's a bit academic, uh, but that's what we like to do. Uh, we like to make it sound fancy. But in the end, all we're trying to do is figure it out is how can we get all these uh, widely varied road users to safely and comfortably share the same space. So this is a new project. So I don't have any results to share with you today. It's a two-year project that we just had the kickoff off call last month uh, with TransLink and our research team. Uh, we'll have final results in two years, but we'll have some inter interim results coming out um, along the way, uh, including some of the other TransLink uh, research dialogues that they organize. And so we'll, we will pre be presenting on interim results as we come along, but I'll just give you a, a little bit of information now about what we're going to be doing. Uh, so again, what we want to figure out is, is, is what are, the, what are the best ways that we can recommend for the cities and the region to kind of group road users together? And how can we design facilities and our uh, vehicle regulations uh, to kind of encourage and accommodate new forms of micromobility, uh, but while mitigating conflicts among the modes? Uh, and, and I have the teaser question up there. Do we need to rethink even using the term bike lanes? Is it not about bike lanes? Is it, do we need to think about some other way of, of organizing road space? Uh, so we're going to be going out, and you might see us if you're using uh, non-motorized facilities over the next year or two. We're going to be going out uh, collecting a large amount of data at, at um, off-street facilities uh, and, and bike lanes all around the region. Um, starting this summer, going through the following summer, getting four seasons of data. Of course, over here at the highly concentrated uh, locations by uh, Science World, but then also uh, further out in the peripheries. Uh, in the subset, we're going to be doing some intercept surveys. So we'll be doing speed and classification information there. We're going to get some usage information, um, masses, uh, some of the more detailed uh, operating characteristics of the vehicles. We'll also do some additional testing out at UBC uh, using some of the equipment we have there. And in the end, we're going to be coming up with some uh, recommendations for vehicle type clusters that have similar operating uh, and physical characteristics, which will then lead to some recommendations for vehicle classifications and facility design guidelines moving forward, uh, like I said, to accommodate a wider variety of road uh, users safely and comfortably for everyone. 
So if you'd like more information about what we're working on in the lab, this is just one. We've got a lot of uh, fun projects in the, react, in the active transportation space. Uh, you can check out our website there and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. <laughs> Not even one slide about the Borg. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. That was wonderful. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. And I'm going to ask our four speakers to actually join us up on the stage now because now it's time to tackle some of the Slido questions that you've submitted. Um, oh, I lost my light. Um, before we begin, I'd also like to invite Jennifer and Scott to the stage as well. Jennifer Draper is a transportation planning manager at the City of North Vancouver. I've had the absolute privilege of working with her on North Vancouver transportation challenges, of which there are many. And Scott Edwards is the manager of street use and public bike share at the City of Vancouver. So the panelists have taken their seats. I'm going to move over and try to figure the Slido thing out. How is everybody? Great, All right, let's see if I can deal with technology. My background's actually also in engineering. So, oh hey, I only had to press it about four times. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, are you ready to answer some questions? Uh, the top question is, it's top by what? A couple of votes. Would Uber, Moby, and Lime talk about future product directions to improve rider experience in the rain. I think this is a very important question for Vancouver. Does anybody want to try their hand at answering this one first? Bravery. Yeah, so I think uh, one, one way that we're doing that is by paying a lot of attention to what startups are in the space. So. Uh, an example would be Velo Metro that's based here in, in Vancouver that's been mentioned a couple of different times. Uh, there's other companies as well that are uh, around the world that are trying for, for, that type, for that type of vehicle to find a way that you can bring electric power plus human power uh, to an enclosed, into a enclosed vehicle. So one way that we're doing this is by building relationships with other startups that are, um, that are actually exp experimenting in that space. Uh, so I would actually recommend for those people who are interested in riding in the rain to take a trip to Amsterdam, where people ride all year round in all types of weather, and the rain doesn't seem to bother them at all. So I think there's a bit of a cultural. Uh, this is a bit of a cultural question more than a more than necessarily a technology question. Very bold. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the I'm, I'm going to ask the panelists actually to hold on to the microphones and then pass them around rather than put. Yeah, go ahead, please, Scott. Hello, my name is Scott Edwards. I'm the manager of Street Use and Public Bike Chair. I know the question was directed at the providers, but from the city's point of view, I think one of the things that's important to remember is this idea of micro mobility. The way it's structured right now in a city is that it allows one way trips. And one of the things that we've actually been seeing with some of the data emerging from our current system in Vancouver is that temperature can play as much of a role as precipitation. And I, I mentioned this, I boldly mentioned this at a council meeting once, and I think one of, may have been you or one of your colleagues at UBC quickly challenged us on that through social media. And it's, so far it's inconclusive. However, I would say that it's rare that it rains all day. And the idea of one-way trips for all of these systems there, I don't know that there's any cities where it doesn't rain somewhere for at least a portion of the day. The flexibility of being able to take one-way trips and adjust your mobility patterns uh, is, I think, just one of the benefits of these systems. I'll echo some sentiments from, from Moby and, and from, from Scott as well. Uh, we have a dockless uh, pedal assist e-bike share in Calgary and uh, the data there in terms of our started operations in October and ran them over the winter. Of course, if you live in Calgary, unlike here, uh, we get some colder weather there and especially in February where it was minus 20 rather consistently throughout that month. And uh, it's not so much precipitation. Uh, that was a factor in terms of ridership, but, but temperature, really. Uh, we've noticed in, in markets around the world is the key driver of, uh, of usage. And in terms of your one-way trip, 
uh, discussion, Scott. I can just relate from personal experience uh, with, with bike share in, in Toronto where I may take a Uber uh, to work in the morning, uh, but then when it's sunny and bright, because it was raining in the morning, it's sunny and bright, I'm hopping on a, uh, a bike share on the way home. If I could just add something else, I think something cities can do to help with this predicament is really put a lot of effort into end-of-trip facilities. And so leveraging all our negotiation skills and making sure that we can have a, an amenity for when you arrive, so no matter what you've been through, you can still feel good about starting your day, uh, even if you're taking a different mode home that night. You know, just quickly, and um, it does get off a, a little bit from the question because it isn't necessarily about making the rain experience better, but I'll agree that um, we'll probably always see a large amount of seasonality in, in uh, non-motorized use, uh, but that's the beauty of the, the, the new approaches to, I think TransLink's calling it mobility as a service, uh, but just the idea of multimodal cities where you have a lot of options, and uh, a person who rides a bike into work doesn't necessarily have to be a cyclist the whole day, and they could take a different route home. Uh, the same way you can take a car share and not have to be a driver all day, and that we can all just get around the city with a number of modes. Excellent. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, we'll jump right into the next question and see how many questions we can get through. The next question at the top, how have the growing use of havens or cor corrals? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Thank you, audience. How have the use of havens or corrals affected the dockless sharing model? Are there ways to do this that preserve the utility of free flow bikes? Is is this a is this a policy question or? <laughs> I, I was I was pointing at Adam because uh, that's something that they've been working on right. quite a bit at UBC um, is trying to corral the, the drop bikes into havens, and I think he would probably be better than me at answering that. Would Adam like to answer? I'm putting you on the spot here. I, I really sincerely apologize. I actually blame him more than... Uh, <laughs> I accept that. Uh, yeah, it's something that we've been uh, grappling with uh, with our pilot at UBC, and uh, finding actually pretty good results of, uh, in terms of user behavior with ver very little incentives to actually park at, at Havens. Um, if they're there and sort of ubiquitous and available, uh, people do tend to, to use them or they use bike racks, which uh, sort of equivalently doesn't have as, as much of an impact on the public realm. But um, I think there's lots of different ways of incentivizing their use uh, further and while still keeping the flexibility that really is the sort of hallmark of the dockless model of getting from door to door uh, from where you want to go. Fantastic. Michael, did you want yeah, to add no, something? I, Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I'd, I'd equate it to if if we didn't have parking spaces for cars, what would happen? Right? So so if you didn't have if you didn't have a space to leave your car at once you drove downtown or drove to wherever you would be, you'd have some of the same kind of space problems as it's kind of out, outlined uh, in social media and, and in truth. Um that has occurred. So I think cities need to be thinking about what is this, what is the space that these vehicles are going to be in at the start and at the end of the trip. And, uh, you know, if you're coming from kind of a suburban or residential area, there might be more space and there might be less space on the, on the other end downtown, you might have to have more, more types of havens. I think the balance that you want to have is you want to still have a, enough flexibility in the havens or enough of them that people still find it convenient that you're able to find a vehicle easily. One of the ways that we've done that with um, with our e-bikes is that we actually have a lock a lock that's built in for you to actually be able to lock the bike to infrastructure that, that allows you, whether it's at a bike rack or whether it's at a, uh, you know, a no parking sign for a car, that you can wrap the lock around it and, and end your trip that way. Fantastic. Scott, did you want to add something? If I could, if I could add another perspective on it. I think that there's the idea of the convenience of the beginning and end of trip that we've heard. There's the expectations for where a user can know where there will be some a, a piece of equipment, a piece of micro-mobility equipment to begin or end their trip. But from an operational point of view, and as we start considering e-mobility, this idea of uh, being able to provide electrification at these hubs or corrals. And from a policy <coughs> point of view for the, for the cities, what Vancouver is looking at is actually in major developments trying to set aside space and have electricity provided as a for foreshadowing of this need that we know is coming, whether it's, it doesn't matter what type of equipment it is, but we're seeing that electrification is becoming more and more popular. And it then supports the operational model, which I think is that trade-off of 
I want it to end right at this door to I want to be able to charge the bike. And I think the operators will need to wrestle with that, and it's a discussion that the cities and the operators will have to have in the future. Excellent. All right, we'll move on to our next question then. And the question is quite simple. It's, what are the safety implications of electric scooters? And I actually went through some of these questions earlier, and there were a, a couple of questions around safety. So maybe let's um, broaden it a little bit, safety around micromobility options, including electric scooters. Sure, it's a good question. Uh, safety is top of mind, obviously, for, for any form of, of transportation, particularly micromobility uh, and particularly e-scooters. A couple things as a company that we're focused on, uh, and they sort of fall into various buckets, but, but initially uh, helmets. Helmets are key. Uh, where it's not law, in certain places in the U.S., for example, we encourage helmet use uh, through various means via in-app, education, um, or, or events like this. So, so wear a helmet. Uh, we're also uh, uh, giving away um, 250,000 uh, 250,000 uh, helmets uh, around the world globally to encourage helmet use. Um, there's the in-app education portion that I talked about around safety, um, but also it's a discussion that we're having with cities too globally about what the infrastructure needs to look like in order to be safe. And we're talking about, of course, separated uh, infrastructure for what I call, I don't call them bike lanes, I call them mobility lanes, frankly, because uh, they will be housing in the future probably electric skateboards, one-wheeled segways, and, and electric scooters. So it's a conversation really about um, the appropriate mode of transportation, traveling in the appropriate uh, part of that road, and uh, ensuring that cities are aligned uh, uh, in terms of, of their infrastructure to support that. I'll, I'll, I'll comment that, um, that there, there's nowhere near enough data yet to really say to conclusively how safe they are. I assume that means compared to other travel modes. Um, and, you know, we're still waiting for uh, uh, all the activity down in California, uh, in particular, and down in other U.S. cities to kind of pan out. Um, Physics-wise, it's... They're less stable than bicycles. Uh, they are more vulnerable to uh, imperfections in the road surface. And so there are some real issues there in terms of stability of the vehicle themselves. Um, and a lot of that can be addressed with education, with better infrastructure. Uh, but there will be some risks that need to be assessed, that, and, and they won't all be solved with uh, rider protection such as helmets. Did any of the panelists have any comments on any other forms of micromobility that are coming up that may have safety implications or considerations, let's say, because I think that... I'll, I'll do one, one more quick comment. Is just that um, it's, it's not just the number of crashes. You need to know how much they're being used, and we just don't know how much any of these modes are being That's used. Fair. So, Yeah, fantastic. The, the Go ahead, Scott. Tens of millions of trips that are taken and the number of fatalities. So the severe end of this, I think uh, micromobility is still proving to be quite safe overall. It's the number of near misses and mishaps and all the other things that I think that we need more data to be able to suggest that. But from, a, again, speaking as a, a municipal engineer, um, being able to provide infrastructure. And it's a journey that a city needs to go on to be able to provide the separated facilities and provide areas for the different speed zones, if you want to call them that, for pedestrians and other wheeled users, micromobility lanes, whatever we're going to call them in the future, um, and then other forms. I think as well that people are, are learning as they go. So with, with e-bikes, you saw originally, you know, people would just make bikes and they would go either with a throttle or with a pedal assist. And then, you know, regulators started saying, well, actually, we should build some classes around these types of bikes and have speed thresholds and and power thresholds for them. So you see now in the U.S. and in British Columbia, our own regulatory framework, you know, requires that pedal assist e-bikes only be allowed to go 32 kilometers per, per hour. Uh, in the U.S. with with e-scooters as well, we see regulation around speed. So, so companies are wanting to be responsible and are trying to work with government as we all get data around how people are using this, how how people are using them to to ensure that on the hardware and technology side that we're addressing that. But I think, 
you made a very good point about the behavior modification side too, especially with e-scooters. You know, you might get on one at first and you're used to, you know, like a razor when you were a little kid, if you're, you know, younger than 30, everyone else is like brand new to this kind of stand, standing and moving around. Uh, so you hit, hit the throttle and you might not be kind of prepared. You might not be in the right stance. It does take some adjustment. It does take some behavior modification. And so we all need to, to work through that in appropriate ways. I think it all speaks to a transition, and transitions are the hardest things to risk mitigate, right, and to risk manage. And it's not unlike autonomous vehicles where we all can see and foresee that when we're transitioning between levels of automation, that's where we're going to see the biggest uh, risk to everyone, right? So I think the risk for us is our is our space. And, um, you know, this is a, a small amount of space that we currently have allocated throughout our public rights of ways that's going to become increasingly congested and more important in terms of what it's delivering in terms of people moving capacity. And, um, and so I think, you know, we really need to... Um, I'm going to put a plug in here for parking management because I know it's a room full of transportation enthusiasts or nerds, as Andrew said. <laughs> it kind of all begins and ends with good curbside and parking management, doesn't it? Because when we can apply all those big transportation levers in terms of encouragement to different modes, reallocation of space, we can kind of ease up that pressure that we have on our, our skinny little strips today and make sure that we have adequate, comfortable spaces going forward. Fantastic. Um, sorry. One, did, one last quick follow-up is, is that the learning piece isn't just for the users themselves, but also for the other road users. So uh, drivers need to be able to anticipate the speed of approaching bikes, and if e-bikes are a lot faster, that's a risk. And if they don't expect how fast the electric scooter is going to be coming on, that's a risk as well. So. One thing I'll add, too, is we've, with the car, for example, we've had 100-plus years of, of, of ways to get used to it, that transition period. Uh, there were times when people wanted to park a car. There was no such thing as a parking spot. So they would stop in the middle of the road, get out, and go about their business because the concept of parking didn't exist in the early days. We've gotten through all of that transition, right? Uh, we've learned a lot through that transition. Scooters have been around for about 13 months. Um, cars 100 plus years so let's uh, there's a bit of perspective that's necessary as well in all of this I think excellent now I think we might have time for one or two questions perhaps a few more, a few more? all right fantastic the next one up top is I'm reading it directly the life cycle of e-scooters is by some estimates 23 to 45 days what steps are being taken to improve this so that these options are truly GHG-reducing modes? Sure, happy to tackle that. Um, so uh, with respect to scooters, I mean, we're obviously in the business of the longer a scooter can stay uh, out in the public and usable for the population in the city in which we operate, uh, the more trips per vehicle per day that a company like Lime or another company in the same space uh, can acquire on a particular scooter, the better in terms of the unit economics. And so what you've seen is, again, um, if we think back again to the analogy of the car that's had 100 plus years of development and science and engineering that have gone into improving that product over 100 years. The cars today are much better than the cars even 30, 40 years ago in terms of a whole bunch of different ways in which you would analyze uh, how good a car is in terms of in the environment or its safety or its technology. Um, so if you look at our first model scooter to the scooter that's in cities today, it's much more robust with uh, te technology but also the infrastructure uh, that makes it uh, last longer in the wild. And then we also take a look at some of the considerations we do in terms of the parts and repair and also the recycling of those parts uh, to do our part that way as well. So um, our goal is always to have a product that's not only robust for the consumer but uh, lasts long uh, uh, in the wild and, and, and available to, to consumers. Yes. So to Chris's point about perspective, th think about it in terms of, of bikes and bike sharing. So if you were to go to pick up a, a dock-based bike that, or any book, real bike share bike, Mobis or, or the one that we have, it's like 70 pounds. It's like built to be shared. It's built to be out in weather. It's built to kind of last. To Chris's point, e-scooter sharing has been around for like 18 months. If you really stretch it out, maybe two years for like the concept, right? So people were doing this with just normal e-scooters that were manufactured for someone to buy take home be in their house and to do that and so 
as companies have seen that this is a massive opportunity, they're putting significant investments into how can we stretch out the life of this a asset and already with, with the products that are on the market uh, or products that companies like like that we, and I'm, I'm very confident the companies that, like yourself ha have on the market as well, it's a much, much longer, more stable uh, vehicle than, than what was at the beginning. Fantastic. Um, I've been watching these next two questions kind of compete for the top, uh, for the top line. One of them is is a little bit specific, I would say pointed, um, and the next one is arguably somewhat um, related. So I'm going to read both of them out and allow everyone a chance to to answer. I'd also maybe uh, offer Andrew a chance to answer as well as uh, as the a director from TransLink. So my iPad lost power, or not power, but oh, there we go. It locked out on me. So the first question, top question right now, given Uber's goal to compete directly with public transit, I'm guessing that's what PT stands for, uh, what are best case studies of jump facilitating better transit integration with first slash last mile trips? And the second question is TransLink is one of the only public transit systems in North America that is still seeing a rise in ridership. Why is that? So it, kind of broadens the question a little bit, allows uh, folks to answer in their own way. Um, so basically, I guess the, I'll let you interpret those questions the way that you want. <laughs> yeah, so Uber's goal is to have a, basically a mobility as a service in the app. So will TransLink still be around operating, operating uh, assets? Absolutely, they're very, they're very good at that. That's, that's what they do, but what we would hope is that we would be able to integrate bikes, scooters, so actually we actually have a partnership with, with Lime and are open to partnerships with others as well to integrate other modes into the Uber app to provide you with multi modes to maybe get you to the end of your journey. Like that's, that's the vision. So part of that w means that your interaction with public transit might be through the Uber app. Um, and hopefully there'd be other, you know, uh, tr that TransLink and other public transit providers would create systems that allow a variety of providers to provide options like that. Because when you have that, you have innovation. It's the same thing with, with, with bike sharing and with e-scooter sharing. If when you only have one provider, it's not really incumbent upon that provider to I innovate and to be push, push the envelope into how can we improve and make more spaces. You want to have choice. And when you have choice, then people are competing for attention. And when people are competing for attention, you're able to uh, uh, have have better options. But is TransLink going to be here? Are we uh, trying to uh, bring bring ride sharing to to take trips from TransLink? Absolutely, uh, absolutely not. We see ride sharing as long as a long term complement to to uh, public transportation. Just add one one thing about the transportation equity. Um, as good as TransLink is, or frankly any public transit agency, the, it's it's probably not feasible. Although it would be desirable, but not feasible to have a transit stop, a subway stop, a train stop at every block, or ideally it would be come to your door and everyone's door. It's just not possible. Uh, so then we think about okay, well, where can micro mobility play a role in terms of uh, shifting people out of the Automatic thinking, I've bought a car, I've got that sunk cost, I need to get from A to B, I'm going to take a car to the nearest transit station, um, or a car share, or an Uber, or a taxi, uh, but maybe I will take something that doesn't congest, add to traffic congestion, that doesn't add to greenhouse gas emissions, that is electric lithium ion battery, electric motor, that will get people from their house to the transit stop, or from their transit stop to their destination. So that's really where we see the, the conversation around transportation equity playing into, at least into your question. Scott? Thank you. I'd like to take a step back from this, and I'm not going to answer the question specifically about the companies. However, what I'd like to suggest is I, as I look at my colleagues and my friends and how people are envisioning transportation nowadays and whether it's transit, car share, bike share, micromobility of whatever shape or style, this idea of being able to link these trips is becoming key. And meeting a friend at an Evo and taking a Mobi there and then at the end of your day after you've gone off to wherever, uh, coming back and using transit, like this idea of being multimodal within one region and within 
city or cities within the region, I think is where, where we're seeing all of this growth and why Vancouver and the region are doing so well with this is because people are choosing to become car light or transportation, multimodal, whatever terminology you want to use, this idea of just having such an option for people. You open up your smartphone in the morning to figure out how you're getting from A to B, and as, as much as it's a preference for a mode, in many cases what I'm hearing from friends is it's a convenience factor. What's closest? What's convenient? What's close? What's going to get me there? And then you start looking also at temperature and rain and everything else. But this idea of being able to go car light and have all of these transportation options benefits all of the modes. It's, it's wonderful to see. Like the, the data that we're starting to see with just growth in transportation overall. We, we talk about trips. I'm going to digress a little bit here, if you can give me a minute. Um, we talk about trips. We talk about the cost per trip. And we so focus on this data. And I'm an engineer. And I love the data. Like insights, I'm a blue, blue, blue. So we just did that with my team. So thanks very much. Um, with that, though, this idea of data, we crunch those numbers, and I love talking to someone like Alex because he's got all of this background and all these choices, and we're learning all these things. But the social side from a city, to be able to suggest that improving mobility has not only the mobility benefits, but being out and about in your community and making these short trips in a mode that's not encapsulated in a vehicle and being able to interact with people near you and being able to not necessarily quantify the health benefits, but there's health benefits, there's social benefits, there's the social equity benefits. I mean, all of the companies offer an equity program in one form or another. All of these other pieces just lend itself to this idea of mobility and the choice of mobility, improving the livability in cities overall. And it's those other less tangible pieces that we can't necessarily quantify with a dollar figure or a statistic that are engaging so many others in a city. And it's supporting micro mobility overall because it's not just about car and bus anymore. It's about linking all of these modes. It's, it's so fun. <laughs> Fantastic. Jennifer, did you have something to add? I would just add that the secret ingredient to all this working beautifully is mobility pricing. So making sure each of these trips is priced appropriately and fairly, and that's what will make it work beautifully. I think you've got some fans out there. So I did want to give Andrew a opportunity maybe to tell us what is the secret sauce of TransLink? Why are you so darn good? <laughs> Well, sure. Um, it, the, I think the thing is it's not just TransLink. It's the entire region. Um, there's a few factors. Let's see, and I was trying to list them in my head. I was looking at the questions. So let me see if I can get them, really. Uh, the first one is consistent investment in, uh, in a transit system over the last decades, growing uh, you know, the bus and rapid transit network. Uh, and then, most importantly, the, all of the cities in the region uh, focusing land use, growth, uh, development, residential employment around that frequent transit network. I think those two things are probably amongst the biggest reasons uh, because you know, this region is a model in North America on, on both of those fronts. Um, let's see, the second one, strong employment growth. We just, you know, BC economy, this regional economy is growing with, with economic growth, comes more travel. Uh, really high gas prices. Uh, I believe the highest in North America. I mean, have been consistently the highest in North America, but now we're very, very high. Uh, and let's see, the fifth one is the lack of ride hailing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I put it fifth deliberately because those other ones, I think, are the big factors. And we have seen um, in, in every other city in North America, uh, who, aside from Seattle and Montreal, who have also seen a little bit of transit ridership growth, in every other metro region in North America, uh, transit ridership is declining. A lot of people suggest that ride hailing has a big part to play in that, and, and it does. Um, they, all, all those other regions don't have necessarily strong fundamentals in some of those other areas uh, I was talking about. But I think to, to pivot back to what Jennifer and Scott were just talking about, um, we will see a decline in transit ridership, or at least ridership growth, when ride hailing is introduced uh, later this year. Uh, in, in British Columbia. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. When you think about the long-term game, maybe some of those trips are more effectively made through other modes, through walking, cycling, shared micromobility, ride hailing, car sharing. And I think the really interesting thing moving forward is about this ecosystem of shared and active modes and that we're all together creating options uh, to, uh, as alternatives to the privately owned automobile.
So I think that's the exciting future. The, the balance, you know, between all of us is going to be shifting, I think, over time. Um, and transit ridership, as more modes and more services and more options kind of emerge in the region, you know, I think it will be difficult to sustain the level of growth we've seen. But, um, you know, I, I think we'll find a, a happy place. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'll, I'll just Please say quickly ahead. that, um, yeah, I, I think TransLink is – is really well positioned to not suffer too much with the introduction of ride hailing and micro mobility. I mean, inevitably, there will be some drop in ridership, um, and there will be an increase in congestion when ride hailing comes. Uh, that's just going to happen. But we'll see less of that here because we have a, a transit system that is so competitive with the other modes. Uh, whereas in, in other cities, they've suffered more because the quality of service in those other cities is so much worse. Fantastic. How are we doing on time? Can we take one more? All right. How, what t I thought that we were ending at 8. <laughs> um, I guess we've got even more time now. That's fantastic. So the next one up there, I'm going to jump right into it. Do e-scooters belong on sidewalks, in bike lanes, or on the road? Opinions, please. They don't belong on the sidewalks. Uh, they belong, uh, we would say, think about a bicycle um, or a scooter. Treat it the same. So if a bicycle uh, can go in a bike lane in Vancouver, an uh, electric scooter should go in a bike lane in Vancouver. If a bike is not permitted in a park or along the seawall, I'm making these things up, and maybe they are, maybe they aren't, it doesn't matter, uh, then treat the scooter the same way. Um, they're really interchangeable in that way. So uh, we discourage uh, sidewalk riding. We encourage uh, riding as you would a bicycle. So think of a scooter in that way like you would a bicycle. Any other comments? Yeah, just cities as like Vancouver has just set out some pretty ambitious targets around the climate and climate action. If we're moving towards that, we're going to need more space for this stuff. So, right, so we were thinking about right now our roads downtown, you know, might ha might have, you know, a bike lane and then still, you know, three car lanes wide is is if if we are wanting people to shift towards this, we need to have safe space for them to, to move in it, which which means that, you know, maybe there is a future where they might be divided. Who knows between the between those different modes? But we definitely will be needing more more space for them if we're wanting people to use them. Yeah, and to echo the comment on space and infrastructure, I think it's also about parking space because that's definitely one of our biggest challenges is uh, taking over car spaces for bike share, and the same thing will need to happen for scooters and the rise of this of the micro mobility. Go ahead, Jennifer. I can see you reaching for the mic. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think the answer depends on comfort too, and. Um, Often that comes with differentiation in speed and, and the ways in which you're traveling. And I think it's yet to be proven whether or not they actually do uh, belong in bike lanes or if they should have their own lanes. So I think we should, we should observe and adapt. We're working on it. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm going on to the next couple of questions, and I think that they're quite related as well. Um, I'll read them both. Uh, one is, what are senior governments doing to support the transition to e-mobility? And the next one after that is, how long can we expect an update to motor vehicle legislation to account for these new micro-mobility modes? And the reason why I combine them is because both of them require uh, senior government participation. And I recognize completely <laughs> that I am the only member of the senior government on the stage right now. <laughs> Although I've also been uh, told very clearly that I'm here to moderate, not answer questions. <laughs> so what I, what I will say is that it is a very exciting time for urban mobility here in Metro Vancouver, in, uh, in BC. Well, not just Metro Vancouver. I'm very Metro Vancouver based as Parliamentary Secretary for TransLink, but in all urban areas within BC. We now have a BC government who is very committed to investing in public transit infrastructure. Uh, that's shown by the uh, by the funding for phase two, which amounted basically to a $7.3 billion deal, the single largest investment in public transit in BC history. Uh, we also have a transportation minister right now who is undergoing public consultation on um, receiving feedback from the public 
on the development of an active transportation plan for the entire province. And on top of that, we've just released Clean BC, which is a provincial climate action strategy that includes, among many other things, a very aggressive target for reducing GHGs in the transportation sector and other sectors as well, but also the transportation sector. And of course, we've heard from a number of our panelists already how e-mobility can per participate in helping BC reach its GHG goals, in reaching its urban mobility goals. We have, of course, a senior government, um, senior minister, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, responsible for TransLink, also known as Miss Selena Robinson. Is she's a very active trans, active transportation um, advocate herself. She's a cyclist. She walks. She runs, um, and she believes in the need to build complete communities. And I think that that's actually a very important part of being able to support e-mobility transition. You have to be willing to com build complete communities where people live close to where they work, where they play, where they attend school, and so forth. Um, having people trans... Uh, use an e-scooter to go from North Vancouver all the way out to Chilliwack every day is probably not the most... Um, well, it's not the mode I would recommend right now, certainly, but using an e-scooter to go from Lower Lonsdale to Central Lonsdale is absolutely a, a, a positive thing. So I'd like to, now that I've kind of said my piece on that, I'd also like to turn it over to the panelists. What would you like to see from senior levels of government in terms of what it is that you, in terms of support for, um, yeah, helping the, the transition along? Sure. No, I think you've, you've answered the question well uh, already, um, and that's uh, the investment uh, making in infrastructure. Uh, so funding often for municipalities is crucial, I know, in terms of uh, their tax base and, and the need for money. So some of those investments are important. Um, and uh, the fact that you've launched, uh, the province has launched the active um, transportation consultations is a positive step. Uh, we'd like to see, uh, we know from our work at Lyme, a lot of municipalities across Canada, um, uh, like Edmonton, Calgary, there's uh, Kelowna and Victoria, Montreal, uh, Ottawa, Toronto, as of today at committee at City Hall, have expressed an interest in exploring shared uh, electric scooter share operations in their city. Uh, but right now across Canada, the electric scooter is by default illegal. It's not permitted on public roads. So uh, all these cities are interested in exploring that electric scooter share operation, but are looking really to the province for leadership to say, hey, people are in fact, you can buy a scooter, electric scooter right now from Walmart, from Costco, from Amazon, have it delivered to your home, legally own it, legally ride it on your private property. But we know there's already people riding these things right now in Vancouver. So it's really a, a very productive, I think, conversation with the province to say, okay, this is a reality. With the advancements in technology and battery life, it's only likely to grow the industry in terms of ridership of various forms of micromobility. Let's get together. Let's have a conversation. You're doing the consultations, which is productive. Uh, and then let's create some um, smart rules around their use so that municipalities, uh, maybe Vancouver, maybe others that are interested in exploring shared micromobility, will have the ability uh, legally to have uh, scooters on public roads. From the point of view of, uh, I think, the policy, not necessarily senior government, but from the city's point of view, we are but one voice within the region, and we've been working quite closely with TransLink and all of the regional partners, because I think as we look at e-mobility, and a lot of the discussion has been about scooters, and those are very short trips, but from a regional point of view, when we look at e-mobility for e-bikes, as Michael nicely pointed out with his commute, which is cross-jurisdiction and cross another jurisdiction, and all over the region and it's convenient and easy topography becomes a non-issue then I think what we have to do is make sure that we're not only having the discussion from the policy point of view with regard to the Motor Vehicle Act but how can we support it regionally and I think the the discussions that are underway right now both for pilots for engagement to be able to ensure that information that we have we're sharing if policies are being developed that it would be applicable within the entire region so this idea of the vision, people are expecting these changes, and in fact, it's happening. They're happening very fast. From a policy point of view, we're 
we're racing, like we're just trying to keep up because the public expectation is not about, hey, it's great to go off a scooter and I was in such and such a city and it was so fun and I loved it. Um, how fast should they go? Where should they go? Like some of the questions that we've posed tonight, I think we still have to make sure that we've got the answers as they're rolled out. Because I know that these systems can be launched extremely fast, but we want to make sure that if they're launched, that they're comfortable within our urban domain and the, the public rights of way overall. Are there lessons to be learned from other jurisdictions in terms of e-mobility, or are we ahead of the curve, or like what, I guess, where where is Vancouver, where is Metro Vancouver in compared to, comparison to other jurisdictions on this topic, do you know? Sorry, I threw that question in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I liked what Andrew said at the very beginning uh, in terms of uh, Vancouver isn't usually first of the game, but uh, we do it better when we do it. And I think there's a lot of lessons coming out of, I mentioned California because that's kind of where just so much is happening right now. Um, there's a lot of lessons and they are changing things right now. And I think there's a lot of information we can pull from there about um, speed limits and operating restrictions and stuff like that. But I think... Um, it, it, we absolutely need to be very conscientious about how we set those limits, but we, they do need to be allowed, but we need to do it with um, evidence-based uh, regulations. So two things, then, yeah. oh. so two things with that, I, I would totally agree with, with Chris and Tanya in the, in the audience there <laughs> about, about legalizing, but I think that that would that would mean as well shifting kind of the Motor Vehicle Act into a Transportation Safety Act, where we're where we're focusing on a variety of a variety of active transportation modes and others that are fo really focused on 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 safety and allowing space for for kind of innovation with within that. That's one, and then the second would be I think there's a lot of challenges, or there's some challenges in Metro Vancouver and even in Victoria in that. Um, there's so many different municipalities and our transportation is regional, but right now bikes or scooters, those would fall within a municipal framework. And so as a business, how do you make an investment if you can only operate, say, in the North Shore or only operate in the Tri-Cities uh, or even if you can only operate in Vancouver, right, and where you, you haven't been able to kind of been able to ex to expand out outside of that, there's there's challenges in that. So I do wonder, as the province looks through those things, um, what can be coordinated at least at a regional level, and but still giving the cities the space, the the authorities over space that are so important, but having safety at the provincial level, and then looking how TransLink or some other regional entity might be able to kind of integrate some of that that a bit. A bit better. Just a quick comment with regard to, you know, how's Vancouver doing? I think, as Alex mentioned, we weren't first into the game by any means. Well, I've been involved with micro mobility and bike share since, well, a long time. Uh, when I started talking in, in groups such as this, there were, I think were 200 systems worldwide, only 200. Now there's more than a thousand or thousands because many of them are much smaller in size and scale. From that, though, the lessons learned, absolutely. We are learning all the time. These gentlemen at the end, I talk to monthly, probably, just to find out what's the latest and greatest within the industry. And they want to know what's happening here in Vancouver and the region as well. And it's not only the discussions I'm having with the operators, but also with other cities. The idea of information sharing amongst all of our peer cities has benefited absolutely everybody. And I can't stress enough this idea of open communication and you know, I'm sure Michael and Chris are so busy traveling all the way, you know, all over North America all the time, and yet they take the time every month or two to check in, find out what's going on. They're happy to share their latest and greatest news, which, of course, I want to hear, um, and they want to hear what's happening in Vancouver. We weren't first to the mark. I think that the idea, the lessons learned from other cities, the importance of preserving your public rights of way, your public space, ensuring that it's safe for other users, are the lessons that have come out of other cities. Um, the other thing is from a mobility point of view, people are choosing lifestyle changes. They're selling a car. They want to know that that system's going to be around. And during the opening remarks and some of the speeches that we heard, that we learned from the Chinese dockless bike shares that exploded onto the market and then left. And for people you know, families in many cities, North America and elsewhere, that chose to sell a car and now that system is no longer in their city because the company left, 
That's tough from a municipal point of view. We want to support these changes on the longer term, not on a boom and bust cycle. So the idea of being able to support companies that come in to be able to provide electrical infrastructure, to be able to provide havens and corrals and docks and all the policy framework to ensure their success when they do get here, that's the lessons learned that we've learned from cities from Paris and hundreds since then. Fantastic. I'm getting the signal that we are out of time, but I'm going to let all of you have one last word. Just one word. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to pick one that I saw earlier, which was, which was skateboards, scooters, bikes, electrified versions of all of these. Which is your favorite form of micromobility on the spot? Electric scooter. <laughs> E-bikes, but also Scott socks. <laughs> E-bikes. Just, just bikes. <laughs> Hybrid systems of bikes, pedal-powered, and, and let me be specific, pedal-assist e-bikes. Definitely e-bikes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all of your time up here and for being so generous with sharing your knowledge. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh. Um, thank you to TransLink for all of the work uh, that you've done to put the speaker series together. And I hope you have a wonderful multimodal trip home.